Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Are we moving from a nation based on freedom of religion to one based on freedom from religion? Has the separation of church and state gone too far? Joining us to sort through the conflict and the consensus are Stephen Carter, professor of law at Yale University and author of the best-selling book, The Culture of Disbelief, Michael Novak of the American Enterprise Institute, winner of the 1994 Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion, Glenn Lowry, professor of economics at Boston University, and Father Robert Drinan, professor of law at Georgetown University and author of The Fractured Dream, America's Divisive Moral Choices. The question before this house, is America becoming anti-religious? This week on Think Tank. In God we trust, that's what it says right here, and on every piece of U.S. currency. The Pledge of Allegiance declares America one nation under God, and every American child still learns God bless America. What would someone visiting from another planet make of this country? Well, based on our coinage, on our Pledge of Allegiance, and on some of our habits and views, such a visitor might conclude that the United States is a near theocracy. Six out of ten Americans say they regularly go to church or synagogue. According to a recent poll, 93% say they believe in God. And every president since George Washington has ended his oath of office with the same four words. So help me God. But it's not so simple. Closer inspection would reveal that America is a mosaic of different religious beliefs and practices with everyone free to come up with his own idea of who God is, what he wants, and for that matter, whether God exists at all. While the U.S. government may place its trust in God, it doesn't place much trust in God's representatives here on earth. The Supreme Court has decided that on issues ranging from school prayer to the display of religious symbols on public property, religion and government just don't mix. And if our man from another planet took a look at our movies, at our television programs, at our newspapers, he might well conclude that America is a thoroughly secular society perhaps indeed one actively opposed to organized religion. Uh, panel, gentlemen, Stephen Carter, sir, your book, a remarkable book, The Culture of Disbelief, has a subtitle on it that says, How American Law and Politics Trivialize Religious Devotion. L let me turn that into, just put a question mark at the end of, of that subtitle. How do American law and politics trivialize American religious devotion? We live with an interesting paradox. On the one hand, as you said, we are perhaps the most religious nation in the world, certainly in the Western world. But at the same time, while we have this broad religious diversity and deep religious sentiment among our people, we have a political culture and a legal culture, in a sense, if you like, an elite culture that too often treats religious arguments say in favor of or against particular government policies as some sort of foreign pollutant in the pure waters of our politics. We have a popular media culture that too often on television and films either ignores the deep religiosity of millions, tens of millions of Americans, or treats it as something to be mocked, or at best a subplot that shows someone's inner zealotry or viciousness. And when politicians talk openly and publicly about their religious views, the media too often treats this as either a subterfuge, that is something that's not sincere, or indeed as a reason to fear them. Father Dryden, do you agree with that? No, I think that's overextended. After all, this has always been a secular country. In the 5,500 words of the Constitution, God is not mentioned. We have, furthermore, a guarantee of free exercise and if people think that the Congress is alienated from religion, they should look at the Religious Freedom Restoration Act passed last year overwhelmingly. That reverses at least one Supreme Court decision and says that if there is any burden on the religious faith of an individual, the moment he enters his objection, the burden shifts so that the government has to demonstrate a compelling interest. I think that's a landmark in the history of religious freedom. I don't think that the churches, including my own, the Catholic Church, should say, well, we need the state more and more to support us. 
That's not the American way, and that the American way is that churches are on their own. Michael, what do you, what do you think? Well, I'd like to make another distinction here. It's not just the state and the church. There's also the people. The people of this country, by every sociolo sociological study, are the most religious on earth, or one of the top two and three out of 160-some nations, in their belief and in their practice. But our elite isn't, as uh, Professor Carter was saying. Our elite is different, not just the political and legal elite, but the movie elite and the symbolic elite and so forth. There are more Americans go to church over the weekend, on any Sunday, Saturday, Sunday of the year, than will watch all the football games, even on television that weekend, or all the baseball games. That is the one thing more Americans do than anything else. But as my friend, the sociologist Peter Berger puts it, we're a nation with the faith of the people of India, led by an elite of Swedes. <laughs> and I think that puts it very succinctly. Glenn, Glenn Lowry? Well, I agree with that, actually. I, th I think the class dimension of this uh, subject is too little investigated, and that uh, the, uh, m much of the tension that I see in the um, um, antagonism to the Catholic Church that I often see projected uh, under cover of a debate about abortion or the position of women in the church or whatever, and the contempt for fundamentalist, evangelical, conservative Christians that um, I see is, in my judgment, not really public debate about religion at all, but rather um, is uh, a, a conflict of, uh, of people who have different class and, and political and cultural positions in the society. And uh, I mean, we can overplay this thing. I don't think we put all these people in a football stadium somewhere, these elites who get together and you know, con conspire against the masses. But nevertheless, I think uh, the religiosity of our newsrooms and our university faculties and our um, other elite institutions uh, is dramatically different from that of the Father uh, Drani, your, your, your three colleagues here are not talking about um, freedom of religion, that, that the government uh, is not allowing certain things to happen. But if you listen to some of the words that are coming out here, that they're mocking it, that, they're, that they show contempt, not they, the government, but we, we the mm. culture, uh, those are pretty tough words. For, You're getting for a little bit historical, Ben. They are. Ah, yeah. And a lot of other people like that. And that they, uh, they feel oppressed and they're whining. I've been in public life for all my life, and no one has ever mocked me. And they have the highest regard for me when I ran and won for Congress, and I was there for 10 years, and that they are anxious to listen. What they don't like is when people oversimplify things. And with all due respect to the fundamentalists, they narrow the gospel down to four or five little principles, and they scream at you, if you don't believe this, that you're going to go to hell. And I don't think that this inferiority complex, or whatever it is, that now besets some people, not all in the religious community. I don't think that it's very healthy. Steve, I, well, I, are, I, are, are you whining? Well, <laughs> I think it's important, I agree, not to push the case too far. But at the same time, you shouldn't minimize what is a very dangerous situation. After all, through most of our history, on virtually every public issue that was debated in the United States, the religious voice had an honored place on both sides of that debate. Nowadays, unfortunately, I think, all too often you hear people who are defending a variety of programs, a, a variety of ideas, suggesting that the religious voice doesn't actually belong in our public debates. And in contemporary political and legal philosophy, you have a growing trend trying to find how we can develop a public conversation carried on by rules that would exclude the religious voice entirely. I consider this a dangerous thing. All right, but I, I think that the so-called elite have been very aggravated at some people in the religious community, such as Reverend Farwell, who have oversimplified everything. And if you don't believe this, if you are not pro-life, then you're going to go to hell, and I condemn you. They have politicized their religion, and people just detest that. That's really fundamentally against the American uh, well, spirit. Well, I, if, I agree with if you. If they detested... Um, uh, say Jerry Falwell uh, or, or uh, Pat Robertson from participating in politics, did they detest Reverend Jesse Jackson from participating in politics? No, uh, and, they, they and, tend and to agree not, with Why not? Uh, because I think that Jesse Jackson uh, doesn't use the scriptures to conclude that blacks are equal. He has the law on his side. 
and that when the uh, fundamentalists go to the scripture and say that I say right here that sodomy and homosexuality are against the law of God, and we can't tolerate this at all, and that we have to do terrible things to the homosexual. They are misusing religion as they see it to come about with a political but, but I objective. But I think, I think you're falling into what is the most acceptable bigotry in American life Sorry. right now. You are criticizing very unfairly fundamentalists and evangelicals. And most people in the elite think they can get away with that. I saw a cartoon in a paper in Florida recently showed monkeys in a tray underneath it evangelicals. That's the sort of thing that greeted our grandparents when they came here as immigrants. It's the sort of thing that greeted blacks uh, 75 years ago. It's just wrong. And I don't think you should, you should oversimplify uh, their I'm views I'm not getting on doing. a guilt trip, Mike, though, because I've heard this before. And that I say that this is all validated by American history. The moment that people use a scriptural argument to reach a political conclusion, we have the right to say the Bible does not justify your political uh, connectedness with but you, can, you can argue all you want, but you shouldn't mock and make fun of and, uh, and uh, downgrade as you were doing. I think that was quite wrong. You don't have to have a guilt trip about it, but it would be all right if you meant to do it. I'm not downgrading. No, I just said that no, they're you are. in error, profound you, error. You are. You were explaining detestation of people. I don't think that's the right thing to do. Isn't I don't think people should be detested because they think the connection between religion and politics is more scriptural than you do. Michael Novak, I mean, shouldn't religion be private? I mean, no. Sh it should not be private. Absolutely not. Uh, I mean, in, in, our, we, we in, in, our, in, in our schools, we should have uh, public prayer. Well, th there's a difference. In our public schools. There, 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 there is a difference between meanings of public here and meanings of private. I don't think religion ought to be locked up inside us because that's not the kind of animal we are. As Aristotle said a long time ago, we're political animals. We're public animals. We have a public role to play. And our religion has just as much to do with that as with anything else in our lives. I think it's really quite wrong to... Pro I'll, sh I'll show you, give you an example how this argument works badly. Take the abortion question, which I think is the front-line religious question today. The one with the most fatal consequences for the whole republic and for the very idea of the social contract. It's a curious thing. People say to me, well, this should be a private decision. But then the same people want me to pay for it. That is, they want to use tax dollars to pay for abortions for certain categories of people and want to make me complicit in that. That's a long step, that's a very long step, which they don't even see they're doing. They want a public policy to back their particular view of conscience. So even they are not consistent on the issue of privacy. We're just not private, lonely, atomic individuals. That's just not what we are. We're a republic, and we have to decide things in common, especially crucial issues. And uh, I think the difficulty is that issue was taken out of the public decision-making and put in the hands of the courts. That was a terrible, terrible political error, and we're still suffering for it. But well, Mike, what do you think of Ben's question? Should there be public religious exercises in the public school? There always were, and I think we were... Answer the question. I, I'm coming to it, but I want to put it in a context different from the context of your tone of voice implied. We, we always did have public religious exercises, as we do in the Congress, as we do when a president is inaugurated. We are a religious people. And it does not attach the, the state to any establishment of religion to, uh, to permit that public expression of religion in the schools and elsewhere. Well, if I may. We've gone way but, too but far. But you have an answer But I, 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 I have a 10-year-old a daughter who is Jewish. Uh, and if she goes to a public school, which as it happens, she does not, uh, should she be forced to say a, 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 a public uh, Christian prayer? No. But the real issue on the prayer in the schools has come down to a moment of silence, of due respect to the pluralism of the American people. That I can live with fine. I well, I, I, I do think that's where there's a very large consensus, but somehow elites, but certain parts of the elites still rebel but against that. Mike, that's been corrected by the Religious Access Act that went through the Congress and that wherever students organize for a prayer session in a public school under certain conditions, they can have it. So that is the federal law. But we are also one people and there should sometimes be liturgical expressions of that oneness. There's a hundred million are, people who are non-believers. But that we are a people under God in a way in which Ben used the little coin expression, in God we trust. There's a quite valid traditional way of understanding that, even if you're not a believer in God, Glenn, in the Glenn, light of conscience, Glenn, in the light Glenn of Lowry, honesty. Let, let, let me just move, move the topic a little bit. Uh, insofar as uh, Professor Carter's book is correct, that we have at least gone somewhat down the road toward 
trivializing religious devotion in this country. Uh, what have been the social consequences in your judgment? Well, that's a large question. Um, we my, specialize in large <laughs> questions, sir. <laughs> my view is that they have been uh, substantial and negative uh, in, uh, in, in the main. The question of license, of the elevation of, of freedom uh, to do what one wants over responsibility is deeply troubling to me. We don't talk about responsibility. We only talk about the rights. And uh, I think we're headed for trouble. I think when we look across our society, whether it's at teen pregnancy, it's at violence, whether it's the alienation and nihilism in our youth or whatever, we see the price that we're paying uh, in numerous ways. And I believe that some of the excesses that we see on the Christian right and in other places in the society is a reaction against that. People sensing that something profound is being lost and in some cases desperately trying to fight for a ground, a place that they can preserve in which their way of life, as they understand it, perhaps in some instances nostalgically so, uh, can be preserved. Now, I think there's a lot to that. And if you look at school prayer for a moment, uh, you see some evidence of this. There's gre a great groundswell of support for organized classroom prayer in recent years. I'm against it, but that put, puts me in a minority, especially in the inner cities, in the black community. The leaders of the school prayer movement in Washington, D.C. are Marion Barry and recently Mayor Sharon Pratt Kelly. And this is being explained and justified in the inner cities as a way of helping to bring some kind of moral compass to our youth. Now, I don't think school prayer is going to do that, but I do think that what one sees here is a desperate yearning by very deeply spiritual people for spiritual and moral conversation in America. It's a conversation we desperately need, and I don't see how we can have that open public affirmation of important values without the participation of the religious voice. Well, you know, our second president, uh, John Adams, said once that what the world owes more to the Hebrew people than to any other is the idea that there is a judge of all, and that no matter how powerful or how rich a nation or its people may become, all are under judgment. He said that concept is what makes civilization possible. That is, that we all have to persuade each other, we can't coerce each other, because we're going to be judged for how we behave toward one another. And he said that opens up the whole path of Republican government, of self-rule, of rule by a kind of self-government, governance. And I think but he's Mike, profoundly right about that. That's a long time ago in a totally different society. But we live by those same institutions. And I believe firmly that, you can, that our institutions presuppose such a notion. And that all argument and persuasion back and forth among us depends on our standing behind, underneath a standard of truth and evidence. But in 42 cases before the Supreme Court, you've lost the argument since 1947. So you're opposed to that whole line of cases. I, I am opposed to that line All right, of cases. Well, I let's think let's gone, get in I that you want to go way back then when the First Amendment really doesn't apply no, to most of the cases in America. No, I, what, I, what, I want to, what I want to argue is that the second part of the First Amendment, the free exercise of religion, has been lost sight of in an attempt to interpret the non-establishment clause as if it meant this must be not a pluralistic country, not a religious people, mm -hmm. but a secular society. Yeah, but Justice That's a Scalia really fouled that up, and the Supreme and the and the Congress reversed him, as I just mentioned, in the Religious Freedom Restoration well, Act. There, there's a lot of confusion in the court. If you look, just look at the way our court deals with the word religion. They almost always surround it with pejorative words, like divisive, um, uh, 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 dangerous. They treat it like a disease that has to be quarantined. I mean, the court should be much more scrupulous about the way it, it interprets history. It is foisting a one-sided view of history on the rest of us in a way that I think is contributing to the growing sense of discomfort and even illegitimacy in the court. Well, I, right. I, I think mm -hmm. I, I was with you up to a point, Michael. That is, I'm not sure that it's true that we can't have public deliberation uh, unless there's a shared sense that we, in effect, stand before judgment. But I do agree with you that it's vitally important that that sense be admitted to public debate, as long as one recognizes that there are people who don't share that sense and certainly have as much right of access to the public yeah. square as anyone else. If, if they have the sense that we need to be judged under the light of evidence, under the light of honesty or candor, the, the picture of the eye on the seal of the United States, I think, expresses that very well. You don't have to believe that's the eye of God. But you do have to believe that's the eye of conscience or honesty. Otherwise, I'm afraid what we're down to is it's your opinion, it's my opinion, and let the one with the most force win. That's why I think we need public conversation about what values we do share in common in the effort to promote a stronger, prominent agenda of good 
positive values. But Wait, Stephen, I, 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 I want to add a parenthesis to this because okay. you, you mentioned the dollar bill yeah. and the Templeton Prize that you recently mm -hmm. won carried an award of one million dollars and I am not going to let myself or you get out of this program without telling us how it feels to win a million dollars. I said afterwards, thanks a million. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to, but that's, uh, that's the way it, it came out. And so I was telling Father Drynan that I received at least a million suggestions on what to do with that. Uh, <laughs> Congratulations, and let us continue the discussion. I'm I think sorry. there's an interesting paradox here to a certain degree, because as we become a more diverse society, which we are, um, we need all the more, it seems to me, a transcendent uh, common understanding of our, of our humanity and of our mutual obligation to each other, which it seems to me is necessarily in some sense spiritual. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think we focus too much on what the state does. I don't think the state needs to be the primary venue within which we talk about this stuff. But, but what disturbs me is not necessarily what public schools do, but what um, uh, the, the attitudes of the press, the, the media, and, and all the rest, the, uh, the trivialization that Stephen talks about, which I think deprives us of something quite valuable for the working out of our common problem. Not only maybe discovered, but Father celebrated Father. sometimes. I mean, there has to be a public expression of it, I think, too. Maybe the religious groups don't uh, have enough credibility. You dump on the media and, and other people like that. Uh, Mother Teresa is universally revered. And if we were more Christian, if we loved each other more, if we did more charity, we'd be getting a much better press. Let's turn to the churches. Maybe they're the negative ones. I would, you know, I, I'd like to believe that that's right. I was at a conference a couple of years ago at which a Jewish scholar said that many people are complaining about calls for the U.S. to be a Christian nation. I just wish it would act like a Christian nation more often. Yeah, yeah but, you know, let's all meet that test. I wish my secular friends would be more reasonable, too, than more humane. <laughs> I mean, if we're going to set a high standard for religious people to jump, let's make it the same standard for everybody. Uh, but, but I do think it's, it's correct, though, that religious groups themselves are responsible for some of this, often through a process of self-censorship. I know a lot of religious people who will not tell their friends that they're religious because they're afraid of what their friends will say. I talked to a minister in Boston who was trying to get some people, some religious figures, to join in a hunger project, and they wouldn't join. And he thought it was because they didn't agree with the project. When he talked to them, they thought if there were too many ministers involved, the project would get a bad name. Is there a religious answer in politics? What do you say is there a religious answer in politics? I simply would like our culture, especially the courts, which in spite of Bob's assurances, I'm not sure are going to back off in light of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the courts, pundits and various commentators and a lot of political activists to stop suggesting the sky is falling every time an individual suggests that his or her religious beliefs may have some bearing on a question of public policy. If that were our view, then the letter from Birmingham City Jail by Martin Luther King, a profoundly religious document, the God is Marching On speech of Martin Luther King, these would be seen as documents that should not have an honored place in American history. And yet they do precisely because of King's willingness and the willingness of others to say sometimes religious and spiritual values have an inescapable connection to public affairs. Well, they also came under the rubric of in God we trust. And so when he says that God looks at our behavior and sees it this way, and you look at it, yeah, it's plausible. A lot of people change their minds. And, and I think that's, that's one reason I want to argue those public symbols are very important. And I celebrate Stephen Carter for raising a crucial book on this issue. And President Clinton, I praise for making religious speech more public and in a reasonably intelligent and flexible way, I think. Uh, you know, I, I think we're making some progress in getting the argument into the public square. I want to say something else, too, about the inner city. Um, there are profound questions of values. I mean, there are, the, the issue uh, has to do with sexual behavior. It has to do with telling little girls and little boys how it is that they conduct themselves and what they do with their bodies. Uh, what respect, you know, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have received from God, right? That's what it says in the Bible. Um, we've got to reach these youngsters, not throw condoms at them, right? I agree, if the churches were more effective at bringing that message in a way that it could be understood and internalized by these young people, um, they would uh, rightly have earned the, uh, a, a greater respect from the American public. But that's not necessarily a popular um, agenda. When I say it's a spiritual issue, when I say it's a values issue, people want to give me an economic critique. They want to tell me that the reason youngsters fornicate when they're 15 years old is because they're poor. That denies the humanity and the possibility of those young people. Okay, thank you, uh, Father Drynan, Professor Lowry, 
Professor Carter, uh, Professor Novak, and thank you. Uh, you know, uh, this is a new program and we would like to hear from you. Please send your comments to the address on the screen. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.